Well, this morning, we're going to dive into Proverbs chapter, th- or chapter 8. And uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up there. If you need a Bible, just stick your hand up in the air. The ushers are on their way forward with some Bibles in their hands. They would love to get you one so you can follow along with us today. And uh, before we dive into to this text, I want to flash back a little bit to our first week in Proverbs. And uh, Pastor Nick, uh, he didn't have these necessarily as notes on the screen, but he gave us some landmines to avoid and some key truths that we need to be looking for. Landmines that will throw us off from understanding what the book of Proverbs is about and key truths that will help us stay focused on what the author is intending. So here's, here's the landmines. If we view Proverbs as a mix and match collection of truths or advice or as a glorified self-help book, if we think, oh, I can take some of this, but leave some of that, or, oh, it's just about me getting better, that would be, that would be a landmine. That would be a, a, not a helpful or a wise way to read this book. But a key truth would be that we need to understand that Proverbs is helping us view the world, how God made it, and also is written to direct us to Christ. That's the purpose of all of Scripture, but even specifically in Proverbs 8. We want to see how God created the world, and we want to be pointed to Christ so that we can obey him, that we can love him, that we can follow him. Guys, those landmines are, are in many different ways, shapes, and forms, right? We talked about the forms of folly last week, things we don't want to pursue. But there's one design. There was one creator who made the world a certain way, and there's one way to him, and that's through Jesus. So as we looked at the many forms of folly last week, we saw that regardless of the variety of forms, there is one end, and that end is not good. So I'll flash back to Proverbs 7, verses 24 through 27. It says this, And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. For many a victim she has laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. When I read this, I picture like a, like a horror movie scene, right? Like you're watching, and it's like creepy and dark, and this little gal is like, oh, this is kind of scary, but you know what? I hear a chainsaw. Let me go check it out and see what's happening, right? That's, that's foolish. That's ignorance. And we're like, no, why would you do that? Or then there's the big bad boyfriend like, yo, what's up? I ain't scared of no chainsaw. I'm going to come take this out, right? And he meets the same end, right? He was prideful. He was arrogant, and it didn't end well. Well, I think sometimes that's how we can be, right? We either are ignorant or we are arrogant and both end with death. That would be unwise. So as we understood what folly looks like and sounds like, we know we don't want to go down that road, right? That leads to, to death, to darkness, to destruction. But today in Proverbs 8, we're going to see what, what wisdom is all about. What does it look like? What does it sound like? How is this one way that God has designed us to live lead us to the opposite of death, right? Lead us to to life. Now, as we talked about folly last week, we saw that it was personified as a woman, right? Lady folly. Solomon is writing to his son, and he's trying to say, hey, son, you you don't want to hang out with this girl. You want to hang out with, with this one. And so this week, Proverbs 8 is talking about lady wisdom. This is who you want to spend your time with. This is who you want to be in a, in a right relationship with. And it reminded me of a song uh, that my parents used to have us listen to in the car growing up. It's by DC Talk. It's called That Kind of Girl. Anyone, anyone familiar with that? If not, you got to look it up. you got to go check it out on YouTube today, okay? But I'm going I'm to give you some lyrics here. Uh, compares and contrasts a worldly girl versus a godly girl. It says, different from the ones before, because I know she loves the Lord. She's that kind of girl. Virtuous in every way, the kind of girl that makes you say, I hope she comes my way. Lady Wisdom doesn't just love the Lord, but Lady Wisdom's goal is to point you to the Lord. That's why Solomon's like, son, this is, this is the girl you want to spend time with. It is much, much better. It's titled The Blessings of Wisdom. This is good for you. And guess what? She, she is coming our way. God makes it very, very clear. The thing is, we need to have a better understanding of what wisdom looks like and sounds like. So that's what's going to happen here in chapter 8. We're going to understand what does lady wisdom look like so that I can, number one, pursue that, right? I want to be with lady wisdom, not with lady folly. And then number two, we want to, we want to live in a wise way. We don't want to live foolishly. We want to live wisely. 
So let's dive into Proverbs 8. We're going to read this in its entirety, and then we're going to go back through and break it down. So follow along with me as we read the 36 verses here. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud. Now forth through the end of the chapter is, is Lady Wisdom speaking. And she says, to you, O men, I call. My cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things. And from my lips will come what is right. From my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge and rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, drill with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride of arrogance and the the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rules, and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness and the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at, the beginning, at first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before he had made the earth with its field, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. So there's, there's a lot of great stuff here and a lot that we are going to get to unpack here. So let's start here with the, just the first four verses. And as we look at the design of wisdom, we understand that God has created it to reach out. Wisdom reaches out. Now we should know that this is, this is the second appeal of Lady Wisdom. At the end of chapter one, she's also calling to men. She's saying, listen up. So these first two questions in in verse 1 are rhetorical, right? Clearly she does. Clearly wisdom calls. That's how wisdom was created to be. It's supposed to be seen and heard. But look at the locations, right? Look at where you can find wisdom at, at the heights, right? Think about like billboards. The the roads through Jerusalem and through Israel, because they were mountainous, would have been in in the valleys. So it would have been up high, a sign to see. Wisdom was there to be taken in by all. At the crossroads, right, this is the the intersections where all the traffic is at, where all the people are at. Wisdom is meant to be seen, meant to be heard. At the gates, I I picture like a guy in front of a football stadium like, get your programs here, get your programs, right? You know that guy? Okay, that's that's wisdom saying you you can't miss me. But even even more than that, at the entrance to the portals, right, all the way right next to the door, there's, there's no missing it. There's no excuses. All should see, right, and all, all should hear. Verse 4 as she begins to speak, wisdom says, to you, O men, I call. This, this word men is, is a, a plural Hebrew word, which wasn't used a lot, but when it is, it means everybody, like all of humanity. And then it says, to the children of man, all the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, right? Everyone, for all of creation. So the question is, are you listening? If you are in this room and you're alive and breathing, you were meant to hear and see Lady Wisdom. That's what Solomon is saying to his son here. 
But the question is, if we're listening and we're not hearing, what's, what's going on? If we're choosing not to hear, if we're choosing to ignore, right, that's of our own. We got blinders on, we're being ar- arrogant. But if we're, we're seeking, what is, what is happening that maybe I'm not finding? It, it should be easily identified. Well, Jesus, I think, gives us a, a hint to this. He quotes Isaiah chapter 6 as he's talking in Matthew 13. And Jesus says this. He says, For this people's heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. He's saying they have hard hearts. They're, they're sinful, and they're not wanting to deal with that. Because ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance led to the horror scene death, right? That's not what we want. And we have no excuse. Lady Wisdom is making herself known. And her goal, again, is, is to point us to, to Christ, to the way God made things and to whom we should worship. So my hope is that here today, none of you are able to leave with the excuse of, I, I don't know, what is wisdom telling me to do? All right, here's what wisdom is calling you to do. Everyone in this room, all of us, he's calling us to the, to the good news of the gospel. All right, the truth that if we would hear, if we would see, and if we would understand in our hearts that, we need to repent. We need to turn. We need to quit living our own way, but, but live in a way that reflects Christ. I would heal you. I would restore you. I would bring things back to a right relationship with me. And Jesus is the wise one who is reaching out to us. He's calling out to you. He wants you to surrender your life to him. That's a, an awesome hope and an awesome promise, and, and, and there's no excuse. We've heard that. But now we need to, to respond. And this isn't just for our salvation, right? It's not just, man, I'm, I'm going to be saved and I'm good, but this is for our sanctification. It, it would be wrong if we would heed wisdom's call one time and then say, oh, I'm good. <laughs> I'm saved. I snuck into heaven. I'm great now. No, wisdom wants you to continually listen. It's continually prominent in your life, and we should continually, as, as Nick defined wisdom, learn God's patterns and live according to them. That is what wisdom is calling us to do to follow the Lord, to know Jesus, and to live in a way that honors him. So the second question is this, right? If we've heard, if we're like, yeah, I'm listening, I got it, I'm surrendered, I'm continuing to seek Christ, well, are you following the pattern that wisdom laid out of reaching out yourself? Are you being intentional to go out and point people to to God and to his purposes? Right, if we're believers, we're supposed to hide it under a bushel. No, right? That's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to hide it. We're supposed to be showing people the wisdom of God, pointing them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to be perfect, or right? we don't have to have it all together. None of us do. But what we're supposed to be doing is saying, I know where you can find that answer. I know where that truth is. And that's, that's in Christ. In fact, as we look at the Bible from, from cover to cover, that's how God has always meant it to be, that we as humanity would be pointing one another to, to God, to his purposes, right? The creation mandate, he said, fill the earth and subdue it, be fruitful and multiply. As his image bearers, we're supposed to go out and fill the earth and bear his image, point one another back to the creator. That's why we're here. That's why he created us. In fact, if we look at the geography of, of Israel, it, it also tells us why and how we should be reaching out. And I was so thankful that we still have this here today, my favorite pointer stick. <clears throat> so God promised to Abraham the land of Israel, right? The, the land of Canaan, that's right here. When they finally come back from Egypt, that's right in the center, right? The crossroads where wisdom is supposed to be of, of the entire world. Egypt down here would have to go up and through Israel to get over to Asia Minor and to Greece and to Rome. You'd have to come back down again through Israel to get to Arabia or up and around the Euphrates out to Babylon, which is where modern-day Iraq is. Right, God didn't put Israel there just so they can reap all the benefits of the trade crossing through there, but he did it so that his people would go out from there to the ends of the earth, from the crossroads to the ends of the road with the good news of God and surrendering to him. Even when you think about Jesus and when he came, Romans 5, 6 says it was at just the right time when this whole area here was all speaking Greek so that Jesus could be right in the culture around the world and the good news of the gospel could be set forth. God has always wanted to be front and center, not not hiding away, not failing to reach out, but 
out in the open and sharing the gospel. And that's what he asks us to follow. So how are we doing at that? Are we, are we hiding? Are we failing to reach out? Or are, we, are we going and sharing the good news? Right? If we're making decisions of where to go to school, where to work, what activities to participate in, in a way that is simply to avoid confrontation with the world, guys, that's not how God wants it. He wants us to be engaging the culture around us. I will say this, right? There's some of us who we would do well to stay out of certain places, right? There are places that we shouldn't go, and for some of us, specific places that are to us where we shouldn't be. But I want to boil it down to to this question. Ultimately, is my motivation... uh, a right fear of God or a wrong fear of man? Am I choosing to do something because I want to honor God and love him and make his name known, or am I choosing to do something because I don't want myself or my kids or my spouse or my friends or my coworkers to have to get involved in what the world is all about? And by involved, I mean by pointing them to God, pointing them to the wisdom that he has intended for us to see. God wants us to go into our schools, into our office buildings, into the grocery store, into the tattoo shops of this world, into our neighborhoods, and and to share the gospel. We need to love for, love and care for our communities, our church, our small group, and our family, and and point them to the Lord. We need to be reaching out as as wisdom reaches out. Well, as wisdom reaches out, uh, it's communicating a, a certain message, right? And that's where we get into in the next so many verses, verses five through 11. And we see that wisdom is a a straight shooter. Wisdom doesn't mince words. Wisdom isn't messing around. Wisdom keeps it real. Wisdom keeps it real. And and we see it right away. Wisdom says, I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking specifically to to a group of people. You simple ones. Oh, fools. Not messing around, right? That's that's shooting pretty straight. And, And I'll give you a hint. That's people who need to grow in wisdom, who are immature, which would define everyone that is in this room, right? We all need to continue to grow. We all need to grow in wisdom, some of us more so than others, but all of us need to continue to, to seek the Lord, to grow up in, in wisdom. And if you're in this room and you're like, actually, I, I don't know. I wouldn't call myself a simple or foolish one. Okay, maybe, maybe you fit that description a little better than you think. And if you're in this room saying, man, I, I am low before the Lord. I am not wise. I need his help. Okay, don't make that a false humility. Truly trust in the Lord's wisdom and pursue that. And we need to start with these first two things of prudence and of sense. Simple ones learn prudence, foolish ones learn sense. This is an idea of common sense, of how to daily operate. Right? Know what to do and when and where to do it. And prudence, other than an awesome name for a daughter someday, right? you can mark that down, uh, it's defined as the ability to discipline oneself with reason and foresight. Right? You're looking beyond instant gratification onto what matters most in honoring the Lord, not what I need right now, but what would be best and what fits the situation. And see, wisdom and its representatives, those of us who would speak wisdom to one another, we're not going to steer you wrong. Right? God is not intended to make you go... Whew, whew, whew. Right? That's what we read about. Wisdom says... I only utter truth and what is noble and what is right. In fact, I can say nothing else. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. It it literally can't can't come off of my lips. Abomination is a word I think we should use in our daily speech a little more. So uh, to define it for you so you know how to use it well, it is a thing or an action that causes disgust and hatred because it's offensive to God's character. A thing or action that causes disgust and hatred because it's offensive to God's character. Wisdom is not taking you on all of these paths round and round to destruction. It's going to shoot you straight. It's going to keep it real. That's what it says in in verse 9. They are straight to him who understand, right to those who find knowledge. It's not crooked and twisted like verse 8 and folly will be for you. Now, I have a couple of pictures that hopefully will help us illustrate this. Okay, so the first one is uh, my favorite street. This is my hometown, Burlington, Iowa. This is Snake Alley. And uh, if all you guys are like, no, Lombard Street is more crooked. Okay, Ripley's Believe It or Not was there and said that Snake Alley is the most crooked street in the world. So here you go. Um, Wisdom is not like this, right? It's not going to 
take you twisting and turning and manipulating and deceiving and saying, oh, it's really not that bad. Right? It may make it easier to go up the hill, but, but the end is here. You may not realize that you're going to destruction, but, but that's the end. Guys, that's not what we want to pursue. We don't want to be on the crooked, winding path. We want to be on the, the straight path, the true path. And so I have a picture here of the straightest street in the world. This is in Saudi Arabia. It's through the desert. It's like 120 miles of just straightforward, no, no weaving or winding. Um, I think it's like 180 miles, but 120 or without even like a little bend. So there you go. You don't want to spend that much time in the desert. But here's the deal. It's, it's not that wisdom is a, is a boring, dry path to follow. Wisdom just has its eyes focused on the one it's supposed to be pointing to, to, to God. Right? It's not going to distract you in mind. It's going to be, be true and right. That's the better way. That's the way that we want to go. See, the, the reality of, of wisdom is that it's better. It's more attractive. Right? You may see like jewels and gold and silver, right? Verses 10 and 11. You may see those things, but, but wisdom is better than that. Verse 11, better than anything you could desire. A material thing or, or an immaterial thing, your desires are nothing compared to the path of wisdom, the path that leads to the Lord. That's a pretty bold claim. But that's keeping it real, right? That's, that's speaking the truth. That's the design of wisdom. is not to mince words, but it's to tell you what is right and what is best. And here's the deal. We, we need to really take some time to evaluate what are my values? What do I see as right and just and true? What are the things that, that I am desiring Philippians 3, verse 8, Paul talks about, I count everything as lost, the good and the bad as lost, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. And being associated with wisdom means we are knowing Christ. And not just that, we, we reject and we flat out avoid the abominations, the terrible things. Right? They can't be on our lips. We can't be messing with them. Now again, that truth may, may hurt a little bit, right? It may sting a little bit to dig that out of our hearts so we can see clearly, but I would rather have that than, than lies that are untrue, that are twisted, that are manipulative, that are temporary. That's, that's not what I want. That's not what God wants for us, and that's why he designed wisdom to point us to him that doesn't distract us from the end goal. When wisdom isn't just, hey, don't, don't do these things, right? Don't just stay on this path and avoid those but wisdom also comes with some, some awesome rewards. And that's what happens in these next 11 verses. Wisdom shares the rewards that it comes with. Nick and Mark both talked about in the last couple of weeks that folly overpromises and underdelivers. Right? You got these big, glorious visions of it's going to be awesome and beautiful, but again, the end is terrible. But wisdom says, nah, even, even what you think is best is is nothing compared to what I have for you. All right, wisdom cashes the checks that it mouth, its mouth makes. All right, verse 10 and 11, those are pretty bold claims. It's, it's better than all the material things that you could have. It's better than all of the desires that you have. That's, that's true. And we're just gonna talk through this list here really quick of verses 12 through 21. What are some of these things? What are some of these rewards that wisdom comes with? First of all, again, prudence, that's my girl, right? That's wisdom's roommate. So you get prudence with wisdom, right? Verse 12 also says you get knowledge and discretion. Verse 13, wisdom comes with a, a fear of the Lord, a right fear of the Lord, and a, an awe and reverence that leads to a, a worshipful obedience. Just like we talked about in Proverbs 1, verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's a good reward when we pursue wisdom. We also see we, we get humility, right? That's the opposite of the pride and arrogance and the way of evil described in verse 13. We also get right speech, right? Not twisted or manipulative words, not perverted speech. Verse 14, counsel and sound wisdom, insight, strength. Verses 15 and 16, we have just governance. That's why Solomon in 1 Kings 3 says, God, I, I need your wisdom, right? I need this because it's gonna help me govern rightly. That's a reward for pursuing wisdom. Verse 17, wisdom gives you its love and attention back. It's not just that you're pursuing it and, and man, I just can't reach it. It's, it's wisdom is, is reaching out to you. It's giving back to you. Verses 18 and 19, 
riches and honor, wealth and righteousness, and the best fruit. Now, this is certainly not the prosperity gospel that Solomon is communicating, but he is saying there there are going to be some tangible physical benefits that you get. Now, I'm I'm not here to tell you what those will look like, right? That's up to the Lord and his timing and his discretion, but, but he promises if we pursue wisdom, you will be blessed in this life, but more importantly, beyond that. Because verse 20, he is the right and just path. Wisdom is pointing you to the Lord and wisdom also grants you an inheritance that fills your treasuries, right? A full inheritance that awaits you in eternity. All right, we're gonna hopefully get a good reputation and physical blessings here, but, but we for sure will get the eternal blessings that the Lord has promised when we pursue wisdom. As we look over this list, man, I don't know about you, but that stirs my heart, right? That helps me give some specifics of things that I should desire. We, we shouldn't be too vague. We need to be specific of, man, this is, this is way more attractive than death. These are things that I, that I really want to pursue. These are the desires of my heart. Right? If you think about what the opposite of all those things on the list are, that's not very attractive. Solomon is intentional, and again, this is, this is who you want to hang out with, son. That's wisdom's design. Wisdom's design is to be rewarding and to be attractive and and to to call to us that we would respond to it. And wisdom, again, God God designed it this way. God created it this way. It's possessed by God. That's what verses 22 through 31 say. It's that wisdom recognizes it's God who rules. Wisdom knows where it's at in the pecking order. And, And this stretch of verses here is, is beautiful. It's a beautiful canvas being painted, and, and the implications are significant. Some of your Bibles may have a, a subtext that says the birth of wisdom or creation of wisdom. And, and what this is saying is that wisdom was, was created by God. Right, the, the word possessed in verse 22 is actually similar to that in Psalm 139 of, of being knit together, of being created. Verse 23, it was set up. Right, why Jesus is the wise one, he is the ultimate personification of wisdom. What we're reading about here is that, that God it actually created wisdom. Jesus wasn't created, right? Jesus is God. He was and is and is to come. But God made his wisdom available to us in creation, knit it together in the fabric of this world. And actually, it was number one on the list, right? As you read this, it says, it was before the beginning of the earth, before the depths, before the waters, before the hills and the mountains, Before us, right, verse 26, before the dust of the world. You guys know who that was? God breathed into us. The dust, the breath of life, that's us. When you say something is older than dirt, right, wisdom is the thing that is older than dirt, older than us, right? That's why old people are wise, because wisdom is of old. I don't know, maybe that's not true. But but again, we see that wisdom has been around and, and was intentionally designed by the Lord. And I'll be honest with you guys, if you know me very well, you know I'm not like a a super emotional guy. If you didn't know that, I'm letting you in on who I am a little bit more. But I even struggled to to share this with you this morning. But as I was reading these verses, man, God just wrecked me. Like, I was just bawling. Like, Lord, what is happening? Why are these tears coming down my face? And and just realizing, man, God, you're helping me recognize or at least get a better glimpse of, of who you are as the ruler and creator. You are so awesome and amazing. And also how foolish that I am when I go against the design that he has made. When I say, no, actually, I'm the ruler. Actually, I get to make up the rules. Yeah, I know you knit all the wise things in here, but no, nah, it's, it's up to me how I want to live. I reject that. That's, that's not how God wants us to live, right? He wants wisdom, which he created, to point us to himself. He makes it so clear that creation is to point us to himself, to point us to Christ, When we truly pay attention, when we humble ourselves, when we look at the world around us, the the awe and wonder is so clearly intended to point us to Christ. In verse 31, right, it's it's clearly not wisdom's world, right? It's God's world. Verse 31 says, in his inhabited world, in God's world, not not to a characteristic, but but to a being, a a ruler. And wisdom recognizes that. He says, yo, I, I saw all this happen. I was there. I was a witness. Can you imagine watching creation and says, guys, let me tell you what. This is the one who rules. This is who we should submit to. And guess what? He, he delights in what he made. He 
He said it was very good. This plan that he has knit together for us in creation is good. And when we rebel against that, we say, I'm greater, then we we mess up God's plan of wisdom. When we say, I know a better way, we we pursue these forms of folly, and and we don't get where God wants us to be. As we read through this, uh, many commentators talk about three relationships that that wisdom in creation points us to. First, a, a right relationship with God and man. We recognize he is the ruler. He is the one who we submit to. He's the one who is, is mighty to save, who has a plan for me, who when I follow his ways, man, I, I live more fully than I ever could. We worship him rightly and we are deeply satisfied in the Lord. Then there's the relationship from man to man, right? We avoid the pitfalls of sin when we follow God's wisdom in relationships. When we're willing to humble ourselves and say, it's not what I want to do in this moment. God, it's what you want me to do. It's your world, your ways, and that'll improve my relationships with fellow men. Even if just one person in a relationship will will lower that temperature by submitting to God, by following his wisdom, man, God will bless that. That'll be closer to how he intended it before we, through our sin, brought destruction into the world. And speaking of the world, the third relationship is between man and creation, between man and the world. God left us here to care for it. In his wisdom, he knit together how we should care for it. He gave us things such as like scientific laws, the scientific method, numbers and and letters, right? Language, arbitrary sounds and symbols that make sense. That's that's only God's wisdom that he's knit into the fabric of creation. Botany, music, all of these things are are sciences, are, are rules, are artistical ways that God has knit into creation for us to enjoy it, to rejoice in the good griffs, to delight as he delights in verses 30 and 31. And ultimately, I think this aspect is my favorite because it it helps me remember I don't have to hold on to this. I don't have to be the ruler. There is one who rules. I don't have to make up the rules. That's That's a freeing thing. I just have to submit to the Lord. Again, that maybe would overwhelm you like it did me when we recognize how awesome and powerful he is, when we recognize how much we've messed up his plan. But here's the deal. When we, when we turn our eyes to the Lord, when we recognize that he is the one who rules, it's, it's freeing. It's freeing. There's a song I've been listening to this week. It's called Maker, and the lyrics go like this. It says, Here where sin and love collide, I stand in awe, arms open wide. The God who joins the hemispheres has joined my fight. Here where sin and love collide, my chains fall off, my fears subside. The God who made the universe has made a way. God has made a way for us. And that way is through Christ, through godly wisdom, which leads us to the pursuit of Jesus. Not our own understanding, not our own ways, as it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 7, but fearing the Lord and turning from evil. That is the way. And that is freeing when we recognize that it is God who rules. Well, fifth and finally here in verses 32 through 36, we see that wisdom demands a response. Wisdom demands a response. Lady Wisdom doesn't want to be left out here just trying to figure out what you're going to do with her, right? She demands a a response. She's calling back to the sun like we've seen throughout the first seven chapters, and this time it's a little more proverbial, right? There's a little more of a pattern to it. The first part of verse 32 is a command. Sons, listen to me. Respond, and it's accompanied with a a beatitude. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Again, verse 33, a a command. Hear instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. And again, a beatitude. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my door. Wisdom is reinforcing, like, take action. Respond to me, pursue me. You know I'm out here, I've reached out to you, I'm evident. Respond. Because here's the deal, There's, there's two paths. A response does happen, and it's either a positive response or it's a negative response. See, verse 35 highlights the positive response. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor, not from wisdom, but from the Lord, from God. And if we remember looking back at verse 17, it says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. So if you seek, if you're looking to find you, you will find it. You will find the the wisdom and ultimately the favor that comes from the Lord, which that makes 36 that much more condemning. He who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. That escalated kind of quickly, right? Whoa, 
I just wasn't responding to her, but now I'm loving death? Most of us wouldn't say that, right? We wouldn't say we love death. I hope you wouldn't say you love death. But sometimes we, we live in a way that would speak something differently. Our response does not look correct. So as we ask this question, do I love death? Think about, am I actually responding to wisdom? If I've never known the Lord, am I actually saying, you are the ruler, you are reigning, and I want to submit to you? That's the only way that you can be wise in the ways of the Lord. And I've been so encouraged by many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who just, the word wisdom has increased in its usage around our church in the last few weeks, right? I'm hearing it more in our student ministry, in our kids' ministry. I'm hearing it more from my mouth and in our house. But it can't just be the desire. We, we gotta respond. We gotta put it into action. Don't just say, I was good at salvation, but say, man, I wanna grow. God, I need your wisdom. When someone comes and speaks something to me that maybe hurts a little bit, but is wise, okay, I'm responding. When there's something in my life I don't wanna let go of, but I know I need to, okay, respond with wisdom. It may be hard, but it's a chance to grow. None of us wanna grow, right? You can laugh at that, that was sarcastic, right? We wanna grow, we wanna grow. Trust me, you, wanna, you want to grow in the wisdom of the Lord. So if we don't love death, well then, do we, do we love life? Right? Is there actually evidence that that's what we're pursuing? Uh, real quickly from Luke 7, uh, I think Jesus gives us a good example of this. John the Baptist is in prison and he comes and he says, man, Jesus, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm locked up, like, what's going on? I want to make sure you're still the Messiah. And Jesus tells the messenger, tell John, yes, I am who the scriptures say I am. I'm the one who's here to save. When he heads back, Jesus tells the rest of the guys, like, hey, John the Baptist, he is the greatest born among men. Like, yes, he's doubting, but he is still the greatest among men. They're like, okay, phew, we can still trust his counsel, trust his ministry. But then Jesus says this, even he who is greatest among men is least in the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying is there's, there's not a hierarchy anymore. We are all experiencing the same blessed eternal life. Well, these people, the, the common people, the tax collectors, it says they rejoice. They're like, woohoo, this is great. There's an even playing field. We all are worshiping and loving the Lord. But there's another group, the Pharisees, the, the cultural and religious prominent people, they have a different response. Right? They don't want to hear it. Whether it's brought lovingly or brought sternly, they, they don't want to hear it. They reject it because they say, we don't want to be brought even. We just don't want to be mighty. We want to be in charge. We don't want to submit. We don't want to respond in the way that would be wise. Jesus tells them, guess what? <laughs> Your hearts are hard. And... and I know that you're not wise because, as he says in verse 35, wisdom is justified by all her children. What is the action in your life? Is there a fruit of loving submission to God, of loving and trusting his ways, or are we wanting to do it on our own, to make ourselves glorified and prominent? The proof is in the pudding. How you live your life will make it very, very evident. Guys, we must respond. Failing to find wisdom leads to death. So are you bumming out like the Pharisees? Are you like, man, I don't want to have to submit to Jesus. I don't want to have to be right with the Lord. Or, or am I marked with pursuing life, walking in discipline, walking in wise counsel, sacrificially worshiping and, and loving our Lord? We're all somewhere different on the, the sliding scale of sanctification, right? Some of us are not on the scale yet. We haven't been saved. We aren't growing in the wisdom of the Lord because we aren't even in the wisdom of the Lord. And some of us have work to do and some of us are further along. But here's, here's the deal. If we're not willing to, as the tax collectors did, as John the Baptist did, count everything as loss. Remember Philippians 3.8, Paul says, it is all counted as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Man, I want to repent and believe and submit to that. That's how I want to respond. I want to respond to wisdom with where she is pointing me, which is a right relationship with the Lord. It was declared good at creation. It's woven into the fabric of all we should know. It is prominent for us to see, but are we are we going to respond accordingly? Again, it seems obvious, right? When we talk about, I don't want to pursue death, I want to pursue life. But there's still a wrestling that we have to say, Lord, I love you and I surrender to you, I submit to you. You are our creator, our maker. You're the only one worthy. You are the wise one who has given wisdom to us. But there's no one greater, there's no better plan to follow than your plan. God, that's what I want. I want to follow your design for my life. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we are so thankful that you have given us a, a great gift in wisdom. 
God, it's made manifest to us to, to point to you, God, to point to how we can live right with you, right with each other, and right with this world. God, and most importantly, it's not just for us to, God, have a drudgery of life, but to delight in it, to rejoice in it, to live it fully now, and even more importantly, for eternity because of you. God, as we think about the fact that you are the creator, you are the sustainer, you are the one who we surrender to, let's stir our hearts with joy and with passion and with a freedom to worship and love and pursue you like we've never felt before. As we understand, God, the gift of wisdom, what it looks and sounds like and, and how it points us to you, how would that help us humble ourselves in a right fear and reverence and worship of your mighty name? God, we love you and we pray all these things in Christ's name.